You look regret. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> tell you what I have in mind. Um, first of all, you have different backgrounds in the, in the area of manifolds, so I'd like to briefly review Besides differential geometry, what it is, is manifolds plus plus structure. So let's review manifolds first without any particular additional structure. Very briefly. And of course, this leads us to uh, vector fields. Which I will formalize a little bit better than last time. And when you evaluate vector fields at one point, at a point being considered a tangent vector, and the whole space of tangent vectors uh, is the tangent space at a point. So you all are quite familiar with this, but I think it doesn't hurt to review. And then a fundamental object of study at the beginning of just manifold theory is the tangent bundle, which is just formally <coughs> the disjoint union of the tangent spaces. But it's fundamental that this thing has a uh, smooth structure and it has smooth vector bundle structure. And the key word here, the headline, is defined by frame, defined by frames. Some of you in physics have heard the word moving frames and so on. Uh, that's what's going on here. A frame which depends on a point. So we're still in the setup of manifolds with, with no particular additional structure. And then we now go into really the differential geometry. And the way I see this is the first the first issue that needs to be dealt with is uh, the notion of a connection. <clears throat> and a, 
connection is something on a vector bundle. Uh, but in particular, on a tan on a tan. Consider on many bundles, but in particular at the beginning on the tangent bundle. And we will formalize this. We will formal uh, this will be formalized uh, as a mapping. We call uh, using the classical notation nabla. So in, in fact, this is called nabla. I have I don't know why it's called nabla. I don't know anything about that notation except I use it in differential geometry. So nabla. Maybe you know, there's some reason in physics it's called nabla. Maybe it comes from mathematical physics. I don't know. So this is this is nabla, and this is a mapping. Um, from the derivations on our uh, on on the C infinity functions, so that's the, our. We will talk about this in algebra. This will be our ring of interest. I screamed at you last time that we should really look at the algebraic structures. So this is something called a ring, and the vector field is just derivations on that. But it's formalized as this algebraic structure, and. This is, it's a mapping <coughs> to the first order differential operators <coughs> on sections of the vector bundle. So I formulated this here. This is the module. You, uh, you, you, you should really learn these concepts. I'm, I'm no big algebraist. My friend Ivan Benkoff will tell me that, that guy algebra is a bad algebra. But I, but I like to formalize things, seeing what's going on. You have the derivations, you have the, that's a vector field. What this thing here is a vector field. And it start, it's a mapping from vector fields to first order differential operators on a function. Makes very good sense, right? You want to differentiate sections of the vector bundle and first order. Not higher order, first order differential operators. Yeah. So the notation that we have here, you, you, you look nervous, but I'm going to be very precise about this. Okay. Yes, the notation is that if you have a vector field, which is in the, that's the, der the derivations, it gets mapped to the operator number x. And now the x is a mapping from sections of the vector bundle to sections of the vector bundle, which is a differential operator. And differential operator means it works like a differential operator. It means not the x of a function times a section. We talked this last time. Somebody made some money from me last time getting this right. It's the function times you derive the section plus you derive the function uh, at times a section. But of course, the derivative of the function is just apply the vector field of the function. Okay? So you see this all over uh, physics? You have to agree. <laughs> Although, so last time you made a point <coughs> But the Christopher symbols, and you said, yes. well, this is a connection, uh, but then there seems to be a difference in terminology. No, there's no difference at all in terminology, and I will, and I will, ex I will explain. Okay. okay. What, what what I'm going to explain, uh, Iman is asking about uh, this connection to Christopher symbols and so on. All all Christopher symbols they arise when I take a basis. Okay, so I mean these things are, are have bases, and once you take a basis, Christoffel symbols are right. Okay. 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 And I will talk about that. So let me just—I'm glad you asked about this. Don't get nervous. <laughs> so a basis. 
Well, no, a frame gives Christoffel symbols that I talked, I, I wrote on the blackboard uh, last time. These things are called Christoffel symbols. But please, I know this is very foreign to you to, to be so algebraic in a situation which is purely geometric or physical, but I guarantee you it's a good idea. These things occur in every subject of mathematics, including algebra, actually, algebraic geometry, and it's a very good idea to understand what the devil they are. Okay? So I will, I will push that a little bit. So that's one of the goals, is to really formalize connection. And after that, I want to talk in detail about parallel transport. I'm just telling you now what I'm going to talk about in these, this block of four lectures. I, of course, will talk about it. Parallel transport along a curve. Curves here are always called gamma, smooth curve. <clears throat> Sometimes the curves are only piecewise smooth, but let's not worry about that right this moment. And the idea is this, you have a smooth curve going, uh, say from a point uh, gamma at time t0 to gamma at time t1. And you have the vector field along the curve, at least uh, on the curve itself, which is the gamma, what we call gamma, gamma dot, that's the velocity vector field. This is all in a coordinate patch, so we can calculate. And you take a vector here at the beginning, and you want to know how to translate it parallel to the end. So you move it, and 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 you move it, parallel to the end. And what that means is, this vector is not changing with respect to the velocity vector. This means that the derivative of the moved, so maybe we call this y, we start at y0, y of t0, someplace in here we have y of t, this means that the velocity, that with respect to the velocity vector, this thing is really parallel. This is, a, this is exactly the concept that we talked about before. Move by parallel transportation to the nearby fiber. Yes. Now we know if you can move over to that fiber, you can pull that thing back, take the difference, divide by h, and you have a derivative. Right? And using parallel transport, we, we understand how, in fact, the, the parallel transport, I'm going to prove this, parallel transport gives, as expected, as hoped, let's say, the connection. Now, that's the first thing that's really new for everybody in this room. The rest of it's a little bit of a review. Connection, connection is the first fundamental thing that's new. Let me just add uh, an additional remark that we will show. That it's easy to build connections. We'll see this by partition of unity. So that's not the problem. There are many, many connections. You have a remark? Might be good. Oh, no, no, no. Sure. It's by partition of unity. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's easy to build connections by partition of unity. 
and the full space, full space C of connections, so maybe connections on the vector bundle E, uh, is an infinite dimensional affine space. So it's a huge space. Okay. So we, I, I said at the beginning, we have manifolds plus connections, but there are an incredible number of connections. And now you do have a remark, right? Yes. I think. Um, no, get your no, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering that are all connections created using partitions of unity because that only makes sense when your manifold is compact, no? No. 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 So. Um, it's he, hmm? Better come back. Maybe you're thinking. Manifold yeah. by definition is better than that. Our second round of all manifolds have that. Yeah, okay. So you always have that, actually. Yeah, I was just worried that you, you know, if you can't do the questions of unity, you won't have you. Well, let me even be precise about it now. Okay? So, if we have U, I, a covering of N, uh, with some locally finite, of course, otherwise I would never consider it, <laughs> probably. Uh, uh, with uh, chi i partition of unity, that's the usual situation. Uh, as he's pointing out, you need something for this topologically. Maybe you need paracompact, but, but for me, all of these things are paracompact. Okay? So, uh, I never said it, but for me, a manifold is by definition good. But not compact. Okay, not necessarily compact. Okay. So, a partition of unity, and then, uh, and uh, Nabla alpha uh, connection, or it's bad downstairs, let me call it upstairs alpha, uh, connection. Uh, on U alpha, that makes sense. Uh, just to restrict the bundle to U alpha and so on, and now you can differentiate sections over U alpha. Uh, then, uh, then uh, you can find. Uh, let's see. I'll try. I'll try to follow your textbook. I remember in your textbook. Maybe put, you put something here. Bar uh, at. Uh, defined to be bar x uh, of s is some chi uh, alpha uh, nabla uh, alpha of, of s. Uh, okay, restricted to u alpha. Okay, so what's going on here on the right hand side is nabla alpha of something on u alpha is okay. So I, I restrict that. And of course, with, with a section, you can just restrict it. And, and now I multiply, that's okay. And now I, this, this terminology here means I extend that by zero to the full manifold. So that thing's globally defined, so that everything here is defined and you check its connection. Okay? So it's an interesting thing is, is, is there's a big Bourbaki warning, uh, uh, warning. <laughs> the Z in the road of Bourbaki is this, one half of a connection is not a connection. You think you, think you can just multiply by anything and so on, but it's quite key here that that's a partition of unity. You just check it. You just check the rule of the derivation rule. You know what I mean by the derivation rule. Now, blah, f s is equal to blah. What, what I just wrote there, right? Um, you will see how you really use the, the, the that's the partition of unity, and it's okay. So I mean, you see, uh, and we will see immediately how on coordinate charts it's very easy to uh, build connections, and in fact. 
most people in physics really just write them always down in coordinate charts. That's where you're seeing the Christoffel symbols and so on. So very easy. So we just glue these things together that were defined on coordinate charts. Okay. But I'm going to do this all. I just want to show you where we're going. Uh, I think I've said enough about uh, connections, about where we're going. Connections. <coughs> And now, I, after this, uh, I go backwards to Riemann. It's very interesting. I, I don't know the history well enough to even say anything, really. But what I'm talking about here, primarily, is due to the Italian school in the Toscana, Ricci, and, and Levi Civita. Riemann uh, introduced uh, what I would call a bundle net. <clears throat> now this is really a new concept. I didn't talk about this at all in the previous lectures. I talked about the notion of connect connection a bit. But uh, this this would be the new thing I really want to emphasize in these lectures. And let me, so you, you have some idea what this word might mean, and then I'll make it precise later on. Okay. Uh, you have a, a manifold M. You have, over every point, uh, you have this bundle over M. And you have over every point of the, this bundle is called E. Malta was very good in pointing out that we should we, pi is a mapping from a vector in the fiber here over the point x. So quite often I write Vx and pi of Vx equals x. So it just maps it down there. This is a vector space. This thing is called Ex. Okay, that's the picture we always had. Of course, everything is smooth here. I mean, it's not just formal. That's all a vector bundle is. It's a bundle of vector space. Now, the question is, what is a metric? Now, the trouble is with this word metric, it has at least two meanings that are not the same. Okay, so I want to talk about it here. So recall, I just taught the beginning course in analysis. So recall analysis one. All right, you, right? You have a set X, and uh, you have uh, 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 something on X cross X to the non-negative real numbers, right? We call this thing a distance function. I actually prefer to call it a distance function to a, than to a metric. Then there's no confusion. So let's call this thing a distance function. Distance. It has various properties. As you know, the uh, of x, y is 0 if and only if uh, x equals y, uh, and things like that. This, the v of x, y. So the things that anybody believes and thinks is, are completely trivial and more or less always is some symmetric thing. But the key thing is triangle inequality, right? So triangle So let's call that a distance function. Some people call that a metric. By the way, uh, these manifolds that I, I consider are all metric spaces in that sense. In the sense they have a distance function because they're paracompact and, and all of this stuff. How's going? I mean, they're, they're, they're wonderful. As topological spaces, a manifold 
There's just some beautiful metric space that's topological space. So we make a note here. And, and is a metric space in the above sense. In the sense that it has a distant function. Of course, not unique. Many distant. Something plus. It's always something plus, right? I don't know what it is. What is it? Something plus. Oh, I know. Toothpaste. It makes your sh teeth shine plus. <laughs> I was just at the dentist, so. Okay, plus. So manifolds plus, it has something more than just manifolds. Something more than just manifolds. And the more, the first, another, uh, the Riemanns plus. is what we call a Riemann metric. Riemannian metric. Or I used to say a Riemann metric. No, Riemannian metric, let's call it. So it is not this metric we just talked about. That's the first thing I want to say. It's not that. Okay? Here's what it is. Here's what it is. So you start with uh, an example, and he did start with an example with his teacher Gauss. So he started with the sphere, and he says, all we have in this manifold stuff is tangent vectors. So for example, we have two tangent vectors here, uh, say u and v, which are tangent to the sphere. Now, what are the only qualities you learn in high school? Everybody here went to high school. I, even I went to high school. So, any, everybody here went to high school. And, and, okay, let's transport these things and let's put them here so we can talk about them. U and V. And let's call this Fußpunkt 0. You see, I already transported it over here so I can talk about it. It's in a vector space here. And, uh, one of the only things you can talk about. Well, you can talk about geometric things. The only thing you can talk about are angles and length. Everything else comes from that. Angles and length. If you don't believe me, try to do Euclidean geometry. You need, par you need projection, you know, you have a triangle, you project, you have all these things. If you know angles and length, you know everything. Yes, ma'am. So those are different tangent vectors. You have to be so you know how I am. So they're different tangent vectors, but are they to the same point or are they to different points? They are tangent to the sphere at the same point. Does that answer your question? That's what I meant to say. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to simplify. You know, if you're a child and and you look at the sphere and you see two tangent vectors at the same point. The child says, okay, let's move them over here so I can talk about it, because I don't know what the devil to do there. So I moved it over there so I could talk about it. Okay? And then, of course, the geometry, so somehow you need to know length and angles. <clears throat> and uh, what you learn, of course, and everybody forgets to tell you uh, at first, is you say, well, okay, here we go. Uh, this is uh, A, this is U is AB, that's U. And uh, V, I'll try to draw it in the same way. V is CD. Right? And, and then uh, somebody tells you, well, the, the, the length well, the length squared, for example, square is better than not square. 
right? So the length squared of u is a squared plus b squared, right? I always like to square it because square root uh, has a singularity at the origin. Uh, and and uh, this angle, this angle here, of course, has an orientation somehow. I think from u to v. I don't. I don't know. You have to really worry about the orientation of the angle, right? Um, and let me see here. Uh, if we take the scalar product of u with v, uh, this is equal to uh, a c plus b d, and that's the scalar product, right? And they might be too long, so we have to scale them, right? So uh, maybe if we take the scalar product of u and v and divide by the length of u, we make them unit vectors, right? You've done this in high school. We make the unit vectors, and uh, is, is this cosine? What is this? This is cosine of, of the appropriately, I, this is cosine of uh, that angle there, which maybe I'll call a theta name. So what did I tell you? It's about angles and length. And what is what is an angle? I don't know if you've ever asked these questions, but I sit at home like an idiot and on a paper and ask myself questions of the order of magnitude. What's an angle? Yeah. So you say what is an angle? And you say what's an angle? Okay, an angle is that thing there. And you say well. At least if it's in this quadrant, well, this is cosine theta, sine theta. And at least here, I mean, if we know theta, we know cosine theta and sine theta and so on, because sine theta is uh, square root of 1 minus cosine theta squared. So all you need to know is that, that to know theta is a measurement of theta is cosine theta. It's the same thing. Some sense, right? It's, in some sense, the same thing. So angles and length are 1,000%, if there's such a thing, <laughs> determined by the scalar product. Or, right? Angles and length are determined by the scalar product. Okay. So what you learn here is the scalar product is the same thing as geometry. At least from this naive viewpoint, right? Right? At least from this naive viewpoint, you asked me to find geometry, but I don't know. <laughs> okay, it's a reasonable thing. Right? Well, Riemann, of course, knew that. But Riemann's whole point in this elementary discussion was look, you don't really have any canonical basis. You don't have canonical coordinates. You don't have anything canonical here where you can define the scalar product, right? You don't have that. Even on a sphere, what are you going to take? Right? It's this whole thing again. Yeah. That was Riemann's observation. Right? It's really some sort of amazing observation in that time of mathematics. So, so what is a scalar product? That's really the question. What is a scalar product? So uh, let's call it, say, say B. Now let's see. Uh, B. Maybe it's defined. I, let's just have some be a little bit precise. This is a manifold M, and here's a point X, and the scalar product is defined at that point X. Okay. It's defined at that point X. So where, where should it be defined? It's still in the tangent space of X, tangent space of X to the non. Well, what did Einstein have to say about this thing? Dimension four, maybe this thing's not positive definite, right? So let's make right. Let's make this 
a mapping into R. Yeah? Do you, do, do you object? You better not object. I'll tell Mr. Schub. No, your professor is not Mr. Schub. It's Mr. Kletterman. No, who's your professor? Both. Both. Okay. I know Mr. Schub uh, quite well, so I'll tell Mr. Schub. If you insist on, on that being the positive real numbers, then um, he'll be very mad at you. Right. There are vectors of negative length. So B, U, U, less than zero is allowed. Maybe. Right? There can be vectors of negative length. However, non-degeneracy should be required. Is required. <clears throat> when you have such a bilinear pairing, what does it mean, non-degenerate? It means, what it means is, is nothing, no vector, except Zero is perpendicular to the whole space. So we have a vector space. We have a bilinear form of this vector space. I talked about the tangent space. It's a mapping of the real numbers. We look at the perpendicular with respect to v of this of this thing. These are the set of these are the set of v such that this bilinear thing is zero on the whole space for for u arbitrary. This is a more sophisticated way of saying that, but it's it's geometrically clear. You don't want something that's perpendicular to everything. I, I, I like it in, in some of my mathematics, but, but at the beginning in, in, in geometry, you don't want something that's perpendicular to everything. If you have something like that, you call it degenerate. Yeah. It's called a degenerate by the near pair. Okay, so what Riemann wanted to do, he wanted to understand what is this thing here? Well, let's see here what, what Riemann says it should be. Riemann says it should be bilinear. Bilinear. So that means linear in each argument and non-degenerate. Positive, it's the geometry you know about. Right? What is the statement that if it's positive, it's the geometry you know about? It is the statement that so B is positive implies more or less. Standard geometry. Can somebody here make that precise for me? Euclidean geometry. Hmm? Euclidean geometry. Good. So let's. Good. First step. Optical isometry. Pardon? Optical isometry. Talk louder. Optical isometry. No. Almost. Any other ideas? More or less the standard geometry, yeah. I mean, up to isometry is the same as your usual inner product? Up to isometry, say it again, is two questions. Up, up to isometry, you get the usual inner product. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's more or less what he's saying, I think. You know, we're <laughs> yeah. So, I would be talking like this. You can choose a basis. Yeah, can't you choose a good basis? Mm -hmm. Let me let me say. Let's I use I don't bring in money today, but all this food. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I will owe you the
the money. Yeah. If I give you this vector in this geometry, see this vector? You see it, right? Yeah. You have freedom to choose another vector, which is not this vector, um, and not just a dilation of this vector, another one someplace here, which as a pair gives the simplest possible thing you can think of with respect to this geometry. Would you, would you do that? I wouldn't. I would do that. Wouldn't you? This is what these guys are talking about. They say, they go blah blah about after you take a coordinate change or something like this. Uh, it's the usual thing. So you can find an orthogonal You certainly can find something perpendicular, right? Mm -hmm. It's just solving some stupid equation, right? However, can you find something of length one? So you're essentially saying that you have an orthogonal basis. Well, we don't, right? If this vector is, is length 85 and this vector is length 10,047, and you want to, okay, 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 he's right. If this is 85 and 10,000 and so on, you can, you can somehow, you can, what are you doing when you do that? You're changing the metric. This, this, Let's make it easy. This uh, b, uh, this is u. b of u u is 16. What's the length of this vector? 4. You don't get to change, but you can change b, right? You could change b and divide it somehow. You see. But uh, what you can always do is get this orthogonal basis. They are eigenvectors of the symmetric matrix. I hope I hope you know that a symmetric matrix. In some, ba in, in some basis, or a, a, a bilinear form has eigenvectors, mm -hmm. and that means it's, it's going to be like that, but the length will be different. It might be this vector 4 and this vector 25. Okay? So you have to change, somehow you have to change, almost get it up to dilation. Wait a minute, not just a stupid dilation. This one you have to dilate, maybe the change of form here by. Four, and here you have to change it by five or something. You see what I'm saying? So it's a non-trivial change of the metric. I would say this, this dilation, which we call conformal, you dilate. Okay, it's like going from inches to centimeters. There's no difference. I, I don't know the factor, but you can compute it, right? So it's conformal, right? But, but if, if it, you have two different directions, and it's length 20, you see what I'm saying? Okay, so, so more or less, more or less, more or less, this more or less, I just explained, all right, more or less, but not exactly. Okay, and Riemann knew that, Riemann knew that we don't have any basis, and we don't have a bit canonical basis of, I hope you can go, you can walk in, Walk in and say at Jacobs University, I learned linear algebra from somebody, and I know that a bilinear form usually can have a good basis. That means it can be diagonalized with the appropriate basis in eigenvalues, that vectors. If this form is positive, definite, that means all the norms are positive, right? The eigenvalues are all positive, but not necessarily one. And the basis that you use to diagonalize depends on the form. Okay, Riemann knew this, although he did not know what is a bilinear form, maybe. I mean, he did, of course, but I mean, it was, this whole algebra was not formulated until much later. It's Riemann. Yeah. You have a tangent space here and a tangent space there. You have two different vector spaces. You would like to say they're more or less the same, but somehow the metric is changing as you, as you move. So Riemann says this. We go from the tangent bundle, and let's go to the bundle of bilinear forms. Well, any bundle. 
you have any vector bundle, and the bundle of bilinear forms on that vector bundle. Have you got it? Yes. Is a bundle of bilinear forms just a set of bilinear forms? Okay, let's go through that. You know, let's go through it with it. You, you ask really good questions, but you need to ask yourself. You saw my new homework system. You're going to have to ask yourself these questions. It's good. Okay? So we have a vector bundle. It's better to think abstractly, not just tangent bundle or something kind of vector bundle. Each fiber is a vector space. Given a vector space, over the real numbers, everything here is over the reals. Okay. Given a vector space, over the reals, you have the bilinear forms on that vector space. Right? If B1 is a bilinear form on that vector space, and B2 is a bilinear form on that vector space, then A1, B1, plus A2, B2, where A are constants, and B, A1 and A2 are constants. You can add them and yeah. Now, a big boy or a big girl uh, remark about that is the space of bilinear forms on a vector space is a vector space. <laughs> right? Is a vector space. Right? So if you have a vector space over x, you have vx, oh, I called it ex. By the way, the reason we use the letter e is the entire space. This is Steenrod's notation for a, a bundle. E upstairs is the entire space, in English, E, uh, entire, the complete space. And he had B downstairs because it's the base space. So it's an entire space down to the base space. And the fiber over X is a vector space, Vx. And now we just make a new bundle. The fiber space over X is the bilinear forms on that vector space. Okay. You can imagine that if, if the vector space is moving smoothly, the bilinear form space is moving smoothly. Okay. Okay. Well, you got it. Riemann didn't quite have that notation, but it's not bad. You have uh, the, the tangent bundle, for example, or any, bu yeah, any bundle, over base space, B. And you can go over here to the bundle of bilinear forms. Let's call it bilinear, the bundle. Over the base space. Okay. Let's call I don't know, it's, I don't care about the notation. You just have the, yes ma'am? Does it, is it somehow related to, uh, in a way, um, the bilinear forms of that space? To a dual space? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. She uh, introduced a new word for our discussion, and I'm, I'm going to follow your word a little bit, okay? And actually, that word I haven't talked about enough. You all know, if you have a vector space, I, I jumped to bilinear. <laughs> That's a big jump. Let's just jump to the dual space. The dual space of a vector space is the space of linear functions, right? Linear forms. Not bilinear, there's only one variable. So you could have one variable or two variables. I jumped to two variables. But one variable is called the dual space. So if I have a vector space, I have its dual space. If I have a vector bundle, I have the dual bundle. Yeah. Of course. And if, the, and, and if things transform here in some way, things will transform in another way here, you can figure it out. Same thing. If I have a vector space, I have the by the bilinear forms on that vector space. By the way, we will talk intensely later on about spaces of tensors. And instead of just talking about bilinear forms, we'll talk about tensors of all types. And it's very confusing. Right now, let's just start. And I'm glad you mentioned the dual space because, uh, well, maybe, yeah. Yeah, I think we just cover um, co-tangent spaces and yeah, 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 but not everybody was there, so, yeah, okay, well, mo most people were there, okay, so we have the dual, the dual bundle and the bundle of bilinear forms, and now when you have this bundle of bilinear forms, what is the right object? 
Here's the bilinear form. Here's the zero section. Now, what did we talk about last time? I hope you, you like my picture from last time. I don't have any color chalk anymore. This one. Oh, great. Thank you. Oh, there. The right object is this. There's a section of this bundle. All right. The right object in a bundle, in a bundle itself is a section. And the right object here is a section. Do you see what that section is doing? What happens is I move the, as the point moves in the base. You don't see it yet? Yeah? That's right. So maybe as you start here at the point X, maybe you go up here and then over X. And that, and that yeah? This would be a bilinear form X. And if you move x, maybe over here to x hat, you would have another bilinear form uh, here in x hat. Yeah, do you require that it's not zero to all points? So we're, we're getting to be interesting now. So you have a section, yeah? You have a section. So that means it's a moving family of bilinear form. It means it depends smoothly on the base point. It's a section. Right? That's, that's, that's great. Now, one possibility here is that this thing is positive definite. All right? That's what you want in Riemannian geometry. And some physics guy over here who's bothering me says that this thing, uh, uh, okay, let's, uh, he's not a physics guy, he's just going to make it negative definite. The physics guy might have signature 1, 3 in a bilinear form on R4, right? Got it? You know the, physic, you know the physics form. We call it the physics form. X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared, that's the standard form, minus C squared times T squared. Maybe you scale it to x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus t squared if you scale it. Right? The speed of light should be 1, maybe. I don't know. Okay. That's a bilinear form. That is non-degenerate. That is someplace in this thing. Right? It's someplace there. Now, you all tell me what happens here if I start over here at a positive definite Euclid. I start over here at x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus t squared, right? Math, Euclid loves that form. Some physics guy over here says this one is x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus t squared. What happens in between? Hmm? The form would be zero. And well, the form wouldn't necessarily be zero. Yeah. No! So the, the eigenvalues are... Um, okay, he's, he's, a, he's a big boy now. The eigenvalues, the eigenvalues are plus one, plus one, plus one, minus one. Yes, I want to be zero. Aha! Okay. You, you got it. Someplace there has to be degeneracy, right? I think that was what you're asking. So it's a very... Uh, I think it's a very good remark here about his question. So I'm just telling you what I'm going to talk about. I, I, maybe this whole lecture is going to be devoted to that. I don't care. Yeah, it, it looks multi. Uh, not multi. Then. Okay. If you take, say, the space of bilinear forms on a vector space. So on some on some things, bilinear forms on on a vector space cross a vector space. Okay, here's zero. Here is a positive definite form. Here are the 
forms, when you leave positive definiteness, you have to.